We are educating students for a, to go out into a world that's different from the university. And they need to, to be resilient and robust. And again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying kind of you grin and bear it. No, I'm saying sure. you acknowledge it can be painful. It can be uncomfortable, but okay. And start from there and then let's work on it and move forward. I asked both Walter and Ron to think about uh, a particular question to open the evening and uh, I'll read it now and then uh, maybe we can have Ron start us off and then Walter, you can take it from there. Um, in your time as university leaders, what elements of campus expression have changed for better and for worse? And given ongoing tensions with COVID and political polarization and, and much else, how should we be shoring up campus expression for the future? Ron. Thank you, Kyle, and pleased to, to be with you. Well, you know, I mean, I, 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 my, my career has extended over about 45 years. It's a long period of time, but just going back to, to my first uh, role as a senior leader in higher education, I, what I would say is that what has had the most negative impact on ex free expression and expression in general on campus is social media, hmm. um, because it makes it very easy for people to do, I mean, and, and, and by the way, before that I would have said email because back in the day, I can remember thinking, you know, people will say things to you in email that they won't say to you in person. And now on social media, I mean, you know, uh, it, it is just gone out uh, totally berserk. And as a result of that, I think that um, it, 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 it means that particularly young people do not have an opportunity to practice interacting with each other in authentic ways around difficult subjects or around topics where they where they differ. Hmm. So that you know, so that what, what they get practice in is kind of slap, you know, slinging some mud back at you or you know, telling you saying you're an a hole or, or, or whatever, as opposed to being engaged in a conversation with someone. I mean, I say to my students all the time, the goal of interacting and having a conversation with someone with whom you have a different perspective or viewpoint is not necessarily to change that person's mind or your mind, but so you have a better understanding about why they hold their views. And in, and in gaining that better understanding, your mind opens up and you say, aha, okay, I don't agree with that person, but I can, I can kind of see why, where, where they're coming from. That's not possible through the social media. So that, that really, that concerns me. And by the way, um, COVID hasn't helped us there, right? right? Now, I will say this, I will say this uh, in defense of COVID, <laughs> not in defense of COVID, but in, in defense of our having had to be online for the last two years, uh, my wife, Dr. Betty Neal and Crutcher, and I have have mentoring groups that we work with. Uh, we have a different group each each year, and we and and we have a large group of folks. I have found the sessions with my men mentees have gone very very well using using Zoom. Not the same as being in person, but when I push them, one of the things we work on in our mentoring group is having helping our students to acquire the tools to have these difficult conversations. Now, it, it, it could be that because we've already worked with them, they, come, they came to Zoom with that in mind. However, I will tell you, fall of 2020, I had a brand new group, a, a, a brand new group of, of freshmen, and it worked really well. Hmm. Um, so it, 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 I, I, I'm not gonna say that COVID has exacerbated the situation, it hasn't helped. That's for sure. Sure, sure. It's fascinating, Ron. I have so much I want to respond to already, but I'm going to I'm going to keep quiet here. Uh, Walter, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this on this question, and also as someone who's active on social media, uh, what you're thinking in response to to what Ron raised as well. Oh uh, no, I, I think he's exactly right. Um, you know, I was just thinking about um, in retrospect. So when I become a president in 2004, that's when Facebook starts. And you get Twitter 2008 or so after that. So, you know, I've I've seen 
the the evolution of social media throughout my presidency. So we've grown up together, if you will, uh, myself and social media. And I can remember that when I was at Philander Smith, I started a lecture series. And that first year I said, well, we're going to hear diverse voices. And so I had Ann Coulter. And people are just like, this is crazy. How do you have Ann Coulter come to this, you know, historically black uh, college to, to speak? And um, she brought out her crowd of people, people who a lot had not been on campus. A lot of, and Philander Smith is United Methods related. United Methodist Church is very uh, conservative. So there were a lot of United Methodists there. I was at one of the prominent churches that following Sunday. And I had several people say, oh, I was on your campus for Ann Coulter. So it was just really interesting. But so there were some people who were upset. I had an alum who I eventually ended up hiring on the faculty who wrote an open letter to me in terms of, but that was still, it was done respectfully. And he, you know, he was able to articulate his points and we disagreed. And when we started a, a social justice center, he was one of the people I reached out to to say, you'd be perfect for this job. And we had disagreed publicly, but it was the way he did it. He thought about it and, and wanted to express himself. You don't get that kind of discourse today. And so it is, you know, with Twitter, I don't have to say who I am. I have some fake avatar of who I am. Um, people who are commenting who have nothing to do with the institution. Some people who really don't even care what's going on, but they just see a fire and it's like, let's go get the gas and let's pour it on. And so that becomes difficult then because on your campus, you have lots of different people weighing in who don't even really care about what's going on. Um, so, you know, for us, if you go to, 2016 and we're hosting this Senate debate and David Duke some kind of way makes the, the qualifications, the only debate in the state of Louisiana he qualified for is the debate at the HBCU. Um, we had all kind of people weighing in from across the country and stirring up things and you had students from some other campuses come to protest and having a conversation with some of our students afterwards they realized like man, these people really weren't here for us because they come saying we're here to support the students. They're the administration so mean and I'm like a couple of days later, all those folks are gone back home. They came to take their pictures and, you know, get the shout out on social media. Hey, we protested at Diller and then they're gone. So if we were so bad, why did they abandon you so quickly? And so it's that's part of the challenge. So I, I think he's right. Um, and I think on top of that, too, persons in leadership are modeling very bad behavior on social media. So particularly elected officials, some of the things that you see, it's like, Man, for real? I mean, those are the kinds of things. So I think it's modeled at the highest levels in a very bad way that gives people license to say, well, if elected people, members of Congress are acting like this, I can act like this too. Yeah. And I think that's making it worse. So I, I think I would agree. And I'm I'm a social media fan, but in every year during Lent, I leave it alone because I mm -hmm. need to detox. It's I mean, it can be bad. Sure, sure. Actually. I, I would love to follow up with you on that, Walter. I mean, you, you mentioned that that as as given that that event you described as president, you're facing outward and inward, right? I mean, you're representing the institution, and you're also you're also managing and working with the institution itself. So, on social media and in person, uh, and Ron, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. But Walter, how what what, what are your personal habits for managing? disagreements that do arise in your own life with other people, whether it is on social media or in person. I mean, the, the weight of knowing that you are just like the, those that you, you, you uh, just referred to in, 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 you know, government leadership, you are also modeling for your community a, a way of yeah. being. So what would you say to, to, to people listening here? I mean, what, how do you go about that? Yeah, no, I think there is a way to, you know, if, if I, I mean, I might challenge things and particularly during the last administration, there were lots of things that were being shared that were completely inaccurate about HBCUs and I would do threads correcting the record and people would attack and I would have a civil conversation with them and there were a number of times when people would say. No, he's really not. He's having a conversation with you. Just don't attack him. Listen to what he's saying. And so I think people did appreciate that. I'm like, I'm not here. To, I'm just here are the facts. If you have different facts that, you know, I'm, I'm willing to change my position. But you know, I've been an HBCU president almost 20 years. I think I know this better than the, the president. So if he's saying we lost money in X, Y, and Z, and I'm telling you, no, we didn't. And here are the facts. Don't get upset. And so, you know, I, I've gotten people who have, even people who've disagreed with me, have stepped back to say, oh, you're not attacking me because people expect people to attack people. It's like, no, I'm not gonna call you a name. I'm not gonna do all that. I'm gonna argue my point. 
and there are just some people you just realize like they don't they're just here to start a fire you don't even engage them and that's fine but some that want to really be engaged and you can get them to see other points of view so i think there are some opportunities and so that's the way that i you know try to manage it but you know like i said there are some people who are just going to be negative and curse you out and do those kind of things you just don't pay attention to them and you move on but some that you you can tell they really want to engage and if you give them additional information I've had people say, oh, I got the wrong information and I understand. And so that's, I, I love those because that means that there are some people that you can reach with information. It's just so hard now with so much misinformation that's out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something that students need to hear a lot. Uh, I, I feel like social media itself sort, sort of primes us to always have the answer, always be right, always be always be a walking perfect version of ourselves. And uh, your, your points about about uh, being equipped with the facts and the evidence, but then engaging and getting messy and also recognizing when it is not worth me trying to be right in this situation or right. with this campus event or whatever it is, because that's, we're not playing the same game right. in this, in this conversation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ron, what about, what about you? I mean, what, what, what were your, what were your approaches for, for, for modeling and, and leading your community? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I need to give some background, you know, when, when I came here and, and when I came to the university of Richmond in 2015, I came to an institution, that was founded, you know, in 1830, an institution uh, where I would not have been accepted as a student when I graduated from high school in 1965. Yet under my predecessor's leadership, the school had become vastly more diverse, both economically as well as racially and ethnically. And when I came to the university in my inaugural address, I complimented the university community on the rich um, demographic, you know, uh, uh, comp uh, compositional diversity. But I said, that's just the first step in, in a truly inclusive community. Now we have to ensure that everyone in our community f can thrive, feels as though they belong. And to me, in order to, in order to have a truly inclusive community, there has to be interaction across the various groups, right? I think that's one of the mistakes that we made back in the day. I can speak, I can say we, because this is where Walter was born back in the 60s in the civil rights, rights movement. And so I, from the very beginning of my presidency, was, was always pressing my campus to be true to ourselves. That is true to, to, to being the kind of community that eventually would become this truly inclusive community. And so I did some things that some folks didn't like. We have a sharp viewpoint series that brings in speakers of, 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 of a variety of, of, of perspectives. And there were speakers who came that people were not happy with. And, and so my approach is always, number one, you can't take it personally, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so you, and you can't respond in, in that way. But I'm, all, I, I, I'm always willing to sit down with anyone and have a conversation. Um, as, as long as they're willing to talk to me and be authentic in the, in the conversation. Um, and, to, and, and, and by the way, in the Sharp Viewpoint series, we would have three of these each year. Uh, we had Carl Rowe was on one. Um, uh, we, we, we had James Comey. Um, um, we, we, we had Jonathan Haidt, actually. He was the first, the first one that we had. And, okay. and I, I would always begin the program by talking about what we were trying to model there, and that is the ability to agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. And we work with, you know, and the hope had been that then faculty would, would work with our students so that the students could gain those, those tools. I mean, that's still an ongoing process. Um, but, you know, I, my, my theory as a president has always been in any given decision or any given situation, all I need is 50% plus one. I don't need 100% of everyone to agree with what, you know, the direction we're going. As long as I have a simple majority, I'm happy with that. Mm. Yeah. To the minority, uh, and this is a question for both of you. Um, I'm thinking about our audience tonight, which is always a, a mixture of, of, of folks from across the university and outside the university. Some are in leadership roles, uh, you know, some, some, some are not. Um, what kind of pressure works to get a university president to notice something? You know, when, when, when various constituents on campus are, are unhappy 
uh, about the look of a campus event or, 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 or more structural things, representation in a department or, or whatever it might be. Um, what, what gets you both to notice and, and respond to that? Well, you know, I guess for me, um, you know, particularly with a, a campus of about 1200 people, I really try to create an environment where we can just have those conversations all of the time. Mm. And I think that's the way if you have a community, you can have those, even if they're difficult conversations, you can have them. I think the challenge, and we talked about this on our campus, if we see students or you see students who are at a larger institution that don't have the same kind of access, and they feel like their only way to get everybody's attention is once again, go to social media mm -hmm. and just put everything out because that at least gets some eyeballs really quickly, uh, even if the information is not correct. And that's the other challenge too. People put things on social media and then they end up having to walk it back or they don't say anything when it comes out that is not even true. Um, so like there'll be sometimes that students, like we've had conversations with some of our student leaders, they'll put out something on social media. It's like, well, why didn't y'all just come tell somebody about that? That was really easy. We could have just, <laughs> we could have just sent an email and said, Hey, we got an issue with the plumbing in the residence hall. You know, that's, but I think, you know, so the, the challenge I find now is that people feel like that's the way that you handle everything. Is it publicly and you publicly shame an institution or people and we're getting away and I think uh, Ron talked about this, I think some of those core skills and there's research to support this too. People are they are losing these core skills to be able to have that conversation face to face, even if it's a difficult conversation to say I'm unhappy about this or I have concerns and not feel like it's being um, confrontational. Uh, there's a book um, by Diane Dean and Art Levine called When Hope and Fear Collide, and they, they talk about that there are these it, incidents where you've got roommates in the room who are having an argument via text message, okay? <laughs> so that's, the, that's what we're dealing with. So if you have, a, you know, a generation that they won't even confront their roommate being physically in the room together, if there is an authority figure like a president they have an issue, they're not going to have a conversation to say, can I meet with you? They're going to go to Twitter and just try to drag you because that's what people think works. But once again, we watch people do that. The airlines, of course, they get it the worst all the time. I mean, when somebody's mad at Delta Airlines, everybody in the world knows because it's on right. Twitter. So I think we've got to start to create lines of communication where people don't feel like they just have to go public to have those kinds of conversations. But that's easier for people because they feel like they can get this out and be confrontational, but not be confrontational because half of the time you don't even know who the person is. So if a student complains, I'm like, I don't even know if this is a student. So if there's a problem with your room, I'll say, just send me an email with your name and room number on it so we can check on it. It's real easy. <laughs> that's that's the, the climate that we're in now that is there's a performative nature to mm -hmm. this. And people don't want to, you know, call it for what it is, but it is, it's performative. And I think it works a little bit better for colleges and universities because out in the real world you know people here in new orleans complain about the energy company all the time when the power goes out and they tweet at energy and it doesn't make anything move faster they don't care same thing with our trash after hurricane ida we have problems with trash collection they tweet no response they don't care so but we're in a different they look at us differently you know you're you've got these people's children and you need to do x y and z so uh, i think it's it's a little unfair but that's just part of the the burden that's that's the way I look at it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. So now, now, Ron, uh, enrollment at University of Richmond is uh, substantially more, right? You're about four thousand. Four thousand altogether. Thirty-two hundred undergraduates, about five hundred law students, and then an additional additional four five hundred FTE of adult students. Okay. Okay. So what's it like for you? I mean, what? Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I, I have to say, I mean, I, I agree with Walter in the sense that. You know, if you if you have not only the lines of communication open, but also you have staff who respond immediately to folks or, you know, let's say e someone even writes me about their roommate. Well, I don't respond to that student. I send it to my vice president for student affairs. And then one of our deans, if it's a woman, it's a, the dean of West Hampton College, the dean of Richmond College, they get right on it. I only hear about it if they don't do their jobs. And, I, and, and you know, the, the, I mean, the folks here have done a great job. Now there, but however there are, I'm gonna give you one example of where, you know, I, it was important to inter intercede. It was, this was a situation in our law school, my second or third year at the University of Richmond, where out of nowhere, four days before a speaker was to uh, appear on campus, 
a, um, um, a faculty member wrote a letter to the whole faculty on the faculty listserv, a transgender, uh, a, 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 an anti-transgender speaker has been invited by the law school. Uh, and this was a, a, a gentleman who had written a book. Um, I think it was called When Sally Became Harry or something like that. And the book, however, had been used, had been cited by Supreme Court justices. And so the <laughs> law school faculty said okay to the Federalist Society for bringing him into the campus. The law school dean wrote an email to the campus to explain the process, et cetera. Um, but then I got kept getting you know, letters from folks, you need to stop this. And so what I did in the end is I wrote a letter and I said, you know, you know, we do not condone or agree with this person's perspectives. However, you know, the law school dean, the dean and the faculty have deemed it important for him, for our students to be aware of what he's doing. We will have a faculty member who provides rebuttal, et cetera. And it turned out, the event turned out to be kind of a, a great example of how students and other people can disagree with a speaker and yet allow the speaker to speak. Um, people came, they wore white shirts. Um, the, 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 the professor who did the, uh, the rebuttal did a great job. Uh, actually, the only person who almost went off the rails was the speaker himself. <laughs> he got upset by a question. Um, sure. and, and, and I wanna end with this. This was the one thing that I, I'll never forget about the event. Our student newspaper covered it and they, they interviewed a transgender person who came to the event. And that person said, it was hard for me to come because I really didn't want to hear, hear what this person had to say. But he said, you know, when you really actually listen to a person and get to know them, they, they don't, they're not as bad as you might think they are or something like that. So it was a learning experience um, for him. So yeah, there are some times when you have to, 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 to do that. But if, if the, the lines of communication are open, let me give you one other example that just happened in my last year, sure. just over a naming situation where there, was a, where there was a disagreement about a decision that I and the board made about not taking down the name on, on the building, but to use, to, to use the whole process as a way of educating our campus about segregation, racism, et cetera. And so the Black Student Association, you know, uh, uh, came up with four uh, things they wanted to have happen to, to see change, including the names coming down. I immediately said, okay, I wanna meet with them. Now, obviously we weren't meeting face to face, but we did meet with them. I just wanted, I, I, I said, I, I, I met with them and I said, okay, this is my thinking behind what we're doing, you know, and, and, and we, we went back, back and forth uh, with it. They didn't, didn't change their mind. I didn't change my, <laughs> my mind either, but I felt it was important for me to at least hear from them face to face. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're both emphasizing so much uh, lines of communication. And uh, Walter, you mentioned that the sort of performativity, uh, you're trying to get, get past that. Um, and, and knowing who, who, who to go to, to get some of these issues resolved and who to talk to. Um, oh, and Kyle, let, let, me, let me mention another thing that in, in, in addition to lines of communication, and Walter alluded to this, that is, but acting swiftly too. Hmm. Not, you know, no, because the, what can happen if you wait too long is that people will assume that you're not going to do anything or you're not thinking about it. That quite frankly, and I'm, I have a doctorate from Yale, I think that's what happened in 2015 at Yale. You know, they, people were working on it, but that's this. And so you need to find ways to keep the lines. Of, that's again, the lines of communication, but to, to do it swiftly. Right. Yeah. Uh, kind of pursuant to that, 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 that point, I want to ask too, a lot of this conversation is focused on, on students and, and justly so, I mean, that's, that's why we do what we do for, for so many reasons. Um, at the same time, uh, a, a dilemma that HXA faces as, as we think through being agents of change for higher ed is that the student population is always transient. That's its, its very nature. And so there's, there's always this, this, um, this dance of maintaining the culture for this student population that is, is moving through. Uh, and the population has changed over time. And more structural changes or, or deeper changes that, that embed a, a, a more open campus expression climate 
in in the woodwork. Um, so there's the work we do for students. There's also the work that 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 we do to ensure that faculty uh, are enjoying and contributing to positive campus expression, and that uh, um, staff are, are are participating as well. Uh, for either one of you, what's for you, what, what, what are some of the pressure points on campus? Who are some of the other constituents uh, besides students who can be contributing to a long lasting culture? Uh, recognizing that there's always gonna be a 2015 flare up. I mean, something's gonna happen, we're human, right? Uh, we're not gonna eradicate this. It's, it's about managing it, but uh, who, who sticks in your mind as people you wanna keep working with to, to continue to deepen a good campus culture? Yeah, no, I, oh, go on, Ryan. Well, I mean, I think you've named it. I mean, you, you know, I mean, obviously faculty and the staff. And, 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 and what, I, what I would say to you is that faculty and staff need as much, a, we, we as leaders need to give them as much attention and help them to acquire these skills as, as the students. Hmm. Uh, in fact, I, I'll never forget that my first year at the University of Richmond, we had a faculty retreat and I was at one of the tables having a conversation about the importance of helping our students learn how to have these difficult conversations. And a faculty member said to me, well, you need to help the faculty too. And, and so we, we, we've done that in, in a, through our faculty hub, uh, through, through a, uh, an, uh, uh, an inclusive pedagogy workshop that we started kind of one off a couple of three, four years ago, and that has now become been subsumed within the the um uh within the faculty hub because in and just giving faculty some tools if you will uh to manage the classroom when they are uh working with students and all quite fr frankly when interacting with each other as well mm. and i i would say it's some is that somewhat similar to uh, for staff as well interesting yeah, I, yeah, I would in include them. It's you know, just with a lot of these issues, there are lots of points of views that can either be helpful or stir up the pot. So, for example, like you could have somebody who's on campus that you know one group of your constituency loves and another group doesn't. I mean, we had a speaker once that some alums didn't want to have on campus because they felt she wrote this sort of tell-all book about being involved with people in the hip hop industry. And so there were some alums complaining about it and the students are like, oh, be quiet. You guys don't know what's going on. And the room was packed and it was it was a great <laughs> event. So you had yeah. that, that you know, distance there. And then, you know, going back to our David Duke event, there were some alums that chimed in to say, look, when we were a student in the seventies, David Duke spoke on the campus and we invited him and because we wanted to hear everybody and that was they felt like the culture of the campus was we want to hear all of these different viewpoints and so they brought in a, a, a historical viewpoint that was helpful and, and probably something that we probably should have done and probably can still do uh, as an institution is for the students to understand the kind of people who have been on campus I mean this is a campus mm -hmm. that probably within a couple of years had David Duke and a young Louis Farrakhan so, but they wanted to hear all those different ideas. And so, I mean, I talked to a number of alums who felt really passionately about, no, this is what we do. I mean, the alums on our board with the David Duke situation, they were like, no, this is what we do. We, we host these kind of conversations. Yeah. Um, so it can be a range of people who are involved in those conversations. But like I said, just, it depends. Sometimes, you know, one group will like it and another group won't, or they all won't, or they all will. It's just, you know, it, it, people are, I guess, fickle in some kind of ways because they have an idea of what they want their institution to be and what their idea is might differ from the person who graduated with them. And so you can't please everyone. That's why I always try to tell people one of the ways when I've had lecture series, it's like, it's a series. They're going to be a range of people. So if you don't like this one, you might like the next one, but they all aren't going to be something that you like. And, you know, part of what I always try to do is bring in somebody who was going to challenge our sensibilities. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I brought Candace Owens one year and I had some people just like, why in the world would you bring Candace Owens? I'm like, why not? And but you had students having conversations that week before trying to figure out who is this black girl who is riding so hard for Trump? They were they were reading about her and trying to that was to me exciting that they had conversations before and after event about this this woman that they were trying to figure out and had that conversation. And I mean, it was it was good. It was robust. It was noisy at times, but it was still respectful. 
And that was to me, that was okay. It was because I was I was there present to help moderate, but it was a great conversation and she stayed and had additional conversations. Those are the kind of things, but there were some people just like, you never should have brought her. There's no way in the world she should have been there because they want a certain type of person. And it's like, yeah, but there were students there who really wanted to hear that. And if you have conservatives on the campus, they were like, nobody you know, comes that has my point of view. So that's not fair to me. So I've yeah. always tried to make sure I've had the, the range of people. So it's like, you might not like this one, there'll be somebody that you like. So just wait for the one that you like. Right, right. Yeah, messaging uh, that, right? Oh, yeah. please. Kyle, with respect to constituencies, let me put in a plug for something yeah. that Walter and I worked on for the last almost year, well, more than a year. And it's a, it, it was uh, uh, organized by the Bipartisan uh, Policy Center. And it's a campus free, it's called Campus Free Expression, a new roadmap. And you can get it free of charge online. And what it does, it, it outlines kind of four challenges facing higher education now around free, uh, free expression. And, and, and it's, it, was, it, it has some very practical things that faculty can look at, trustees, presidents, et cetera. So I think it's, it's something that I'd like, I just want the people on the call uh, tonight to be aware of. Yeah, you know, thank you for that. Thank you for, for that. Yeah, there's, there's, we need more public publications on this. We need to hear these practices uh, that are happening locally on campuses just shared broadly so that we can have as many um, examples and models as possible for, for, for doing, this, doing this work well. Um, quick reminder to the group that uh, we are going to be taking questions in another few minutes. As much as I don't want to stop talking with, with Walter and Ron directly here, uh, we've got questions pouring in, but please feel free to get them in now if, uh, if, if you have any. Uh, want to shift gears for a moment here and ask sort of uh, two, two two gigantic questions and and uh, which, whichever uh, hits either one of you as 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 most relevant to your experience, please please feel free to respond. Um, COVID's come up a couple times here, and I myself as a teacher have had the same experience where COVID changed my my instruction. A lot of it a lot of it was damaging, obviously. Being separated from my students was awful. Uh, not being able to read body language was terrible. At the same time, some weird things happened. My, my introverted students had a new lease on life. They, they were able to engage more in a class when they didn't feel the eyes on them so much. And uh, breakout rooms and the ability to put people in small groups was, was a lot easier. Uh, as we return to campus and, and things start to open back up again, what 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 would you say to faculty and to students? What's what's one thing that practice they should be taking up and really having in the forefront of their minds as we start to share the space together? And related to that, uh, you know, it being it being Black History Month and our and our minds being on on the, the, the sort of different uh, experiences that different demographics have on campus. How do you see? Uh, campus expression changing with relation to different demographics on campus, particularly students of color. And uh, as we all get back on campus again, right? Uh, what, what can what can campuses be doing to be ensuring that the campus expression climate is, is truly open for all um, and, and practicing well for, for, for all individuals? Big questions, but I'd love to hear what's on your minds there. So I, I think I'll probably lean toward the second one, because with the first one, we really never um, closed the campus. We were housing students the entire time, and particularly that's part of the survey we did with our student body, you know, mm -hmm. 70, 75 percent pale. So a lot of students being at school isn't just being at school. It's, it eliminates, you know, food and housing insecurity. Um, so we were still here. We didn't have, you know, the kinds of events that we normally would have had, but and that was part of it. But I mean, as, as people start to have events and open back up, you know, I, I think the challenge is, you know, um, over during the course of the pandemic, I think that there has been an, an inflamed sense of partisanship. And so I don't know how people are going to respond, particularly going into this midterm year. It's, sure. it's, um, it's concerning for me. So for example, I, I was in Houston yesterday. I, I had to speak at Texas A&M last night and I was looking at my research and looking at black fraternities and sororities and public service. So, it, you know, non-controversial topic, not a big deal. But when I get back to Houston, uh, I'm watching on the news that Senator Ted Cruz speaks or has a meeting 
with some students and administrators at Texas Southern University, which is an HBCU. And one of the state senators wrote an open letter that he put on Twitter to the president and the board chair saying, you guys didn't tell me Ted Cruz is going to be on campus and I understand public institution, but this guy isn't really in line with what we are trying to do. So it made a really, it's a really interesting, you know, situation where you, you know, he is a senator. He's interviewed, he says, yes, I need to see what the needs are to try to help. That's, that's his job. He should be doing that. But at the same time, the reporters are asking him, well, you said some strong things about critical race theory. So he goes into why he's opposed to that on the camp, while he's on the campus of a historical black institution. He's also been very critical of the president saying he's going to nominate a black woman for the Supreme Court, a campus that's two thirds black women. So it was a really interesting dynamic to have someone who really to do his job, he should be meeting with people on that campus, but the student government and other people protested or and they just boycotted the meeting and the state senator who represents that area publicly calls out everybody saying, why is this guy on campus? Mm -hmm. I don't know what you do with that because you should be able to have that meeting, but then at the same time, he really is supporting ideas that are antithetical to your population. Sure. <laughs> so what's what's the right answer there? And I don't know. And I think they're going to be more of those kind of situations. I mean, ideally, if they had some open forum where he could still meet and get that information, but to have a robust discussion about critical race theory or why he doesn't feel that there should be a focus on black women, just to have that honest conversation, I think that would have been a great thing to do. Um, but that was a unique situation to say, yeah, he should be there as a part of his job, but him being there is going to be a problem because he said things that will, you know, offend the sensibilities of most of that population. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think you're just going to have, you know, going into the mid, particularly when you have, you know, the tax on what's happening in the curriculum, the challenges with faculty and what they're teaching. Uh, yeah. I think this that's really going to be interesting. So I'm concerned how we have those kind of conversations The people are running for office and they'll want to be on college campuses to have forums and uh, it's going to be really interesting. So the midterm will be interesting, and then 2024 might be something altogether different. So. Altogether different, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, so so preparing for that, uh, I, I would say making sure that we have the resources and the tools in place for people to, to grab quickly when they when they have an incident coming or or, or training people to, to be um, uh, ready to, to deal with incidents, whether there are upticks in classrooms or, or uh, on the quad. Yeah, it's... It's a good morning, Walter. Uh, Ron, any thoughts? Uh, absolutely. And one thing I would say, just with respect to Walter's last comments, which really, that's amazing, that in the, the most recent Knight survey, so Knight's been doing these surveys about mm. getting uh, uh, gauging young people's uh, um, opinions about um, free expression, 65% uh, of, of students said they were hesitant to make statements or say things that might be considered insensitive or might, but without, with, with which other people might disagree. That's gone up 11 points since 2016 when they did the first survey. So it's not a good, it, it's not a good barometer, particularly in terms of just, you know, if our role as university heads in terms of helping to educate and engage citizenry. Because you know the, the, our our democracy depends upon the the health healthy debate. So anyway, let, let me get to the question. First of all, we we like um, uh, Walters Institution. We we never close down. So uh, sixty seven percent of our classes first semester twenty twenty were in person, and about seventy percent in the second semester were in person. Um, and and some were some were the the thirty percent or thirty three percent were primarily um, uh, hybrid, hybrid, hybrid ones. Um, but you know, what I would say is that uh, with respect to your other uh, question about the various groups, I mean, the goal of any campus ought to be to ensure that every member of the campus community can fulfill their potential and take advantage of everything the campus has to offer. And most important, feels as though they belong there. That they, so that they, they don't feel like a guest in someone else's home. And, um, and, and, and in order to, to do that, you have to be very intentional. 
uh, on, the, on the student side, as well as uh, faculty uh, and, uh, and staff. I mean, you can do you know, more with students you know, in, in orientation and first year programs. Mm -hmm. And for instance, what we've done with the students, I, I, I you know, we used to do a lot of stuff during orientation. And, and I was always an advocate for spreading some of that over the semester because they get thrown so much at, at them. And so, you know, now we have a, the, a fund that was established in, in my honor when I stepped down. It's called a, um, a, a, an inclusion and dialogue fund. And mm -hmm. so we have, you know, people who are trained mentors, not mentors, trained facilitators for small, small dialogue groups. And the first year seminar professors can call, can utilize these facilitators within their first year seminars to help give students some of these tools. I mean, right. that's just one, one example, but there have to be more mm -hmm. uh, be, because the, the goal ought to be to ensure that by the time a student graduates from your university, they're very comfortable sitting down with someone with whom they don't agree or who has a different perspective and having a, a conversation and, and, uh, and know how to actively listen um, so that they can then understand and have a, a more open mind. Um, and, and we have to do that for every group. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. I, I appreciate both of your words of affirmation and encouragement and sort of practical feedback and also caution and warning that, that uh, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire that we're coming out of COVID here by walking into a, a real political uh, moment of political upheaval and, and probable friction. And so thinking ahead about these supports we can have in place really matter. Uh, I have questions for you from our audience. Our conversation has stoked some really, really interesting ones. So if it's okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift to that because some of these are, are pretty meaty. Um, so let's see, let's start at the top here. So scientific research requires having different perspectives. At the same time, students, staff, and faculty with heterodox perspectives increasingly believe they cannot speak freely on college campuses or are afraid of censorship or losing opportunities for speaking freely. Side note, in our own CES indicated from, from last year into, into this year that 62% of sample college students agreed the climate on the campus prevented them from saying, saying the things that they believe. So this is, this is a real issue. How, how would you change the culture on campus to make sure students, staff, and faculty are less afraid to speak freely on campus? Well, let, 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 me, just, let me just say, um, I don't think I mentioned this, but I, I've been really keenly interested in this topic of free expression on campus since fall of 2016 when I, I participated in a convening by the um, Knight Foundation uh, where, they were in, where, where they were explaining to us the first survey that they did. And, uh, and, and what I would say is that as a result of that, um, I really became determined to engage my campus community in conversations about these issues and particularly focusing on this notion that free expression somehow impedes diversity and inclusion, our diversity mm. and inclusion goals. And, um, uh, and, and in addition to the Sharp Viewpoint series, I and mean, we started having conversations through the, in the faculty and students uh, and, and staff about developing our own free expression statement at the University of Richmond. And, and, and the process of developing that statement, which was developed by a committee of six faculty members, include, took longer than, than some of my trustees would have liked, um, but it really was a great opportunity for um, people to have conversations about this issue and why it was important. And again, I'm not going to claim that everyone, you know, was shouting hallelujah and, and, and uh, claiming victory. Uh, but I what I would say is that we had in some incredibly deep conversations about the importance of, 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 of learning how to listen carefully to people, even if you don't agree with them, the importance of having disparate voices on campus and things of that sort. And I, and I will say to you, I, actually we, we did meetings with students, faculty and staff separately. And the student facilitators, we had small groups, were the best. Um, so, it, it, so my answer, that's a long-winded way of saying, it's not, something, it's not something you can 
you, you know, you can prescribe. If, if that were the case, I'd be a gazillionaire. It's something that is incremental and it takes time and you have to be, and, and, and there has to be leadership pushing these ideas. The kind of leadership that Walter has, has demonstrated at his two institutions, that's what you need. And you always have to constantly be reminding people of why you are espousing those views. And there will be people who won't be happy with you. Uh, be because you're espousing those views. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Ron. Walter, any thoughts on that? No, I, yeah, I would agree. I, like I said, I, I just really try to make an effort to bring different voices to campus so that people can hear and see people who might resonate with them, um, just to give them that sense that they can have those conversations. Uh, and I think it's good when it's modeled um from leadership on the campus so to me that's just been the best way to do it just to, to have those to shake you know i always tell people hey, i, I want to invite someone who makes me you know uneasy because i still need to be challenged and i need to grow too so to have those and i found those to be like i said i mentioned ann coulter that was and that was crazy because i was still i was relatively new as president there and mm -hmm. so you know i could have been sent home pretty quickly to be able to do that <laughs> Uh, but I, I told people that in, there are so many things I don't agree with her on. She targeted her speech to focus on things that African Americans are conservative about. So it was smart to do that. And then we had dinner afterwards. And I, I kid you not, we argued at dinner for two hours and I had a ball. It was wonderful. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was great. Like I said, yeah. we didn't agree on much, but it was still, it was, it was really good debate. It was very civil. We had a good time and we just don't agree. And I think there is some value in, in telling people that, yeah, right now, if Ann Coulter came to town and sent me a note like, hey, let's get together, I would go hang out with her. I don't have a problem doing that. We're still not going to agree on a lot of things, even though I think she probably agrees with me more on some things now based on what she's been talking about in the last year. But um, I think we've got to learn how to do that and a model that to say, here is somebody I don't agree with. Let's learn how to have those kind of conversations. And I think that's, we, you know, and, and I think what's hurting higher ed is that it's just not being modeled, you know, at the highest level. So we just see this juvenile back and forth with these elected people who get all this airtime and, you know, every tweet that they send out, it gets covered. And I mean, so we're fighting an uphill battle. And that's the that's the really sad thing about it. So it's sort of hard to say, let's get together and have civil conversation. And then somebody has a commercial where they're shooting you know, guns at people at the other party. I mean, so I don't know what we do with that. So that's I think that's the challenge that I think frustrates me is that now we're sort of operating in these little you know bubbles or, or silos um, in terms of higher education and they're going to go out and so hopefully we have to hope that we will have students who will leave our institutions and go out and help change the broader community. Uh, but I, it's more of an uphill battle now than it would have been when I started as a president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to, to stay on that for a moment, there's a, there's a kind of a closely related question here for, for when things go wrong. Uh, so uh, a, a growing number of students deliberately choose to be provocative and disruptive. What are your boundaries? And when do we call on law enforcement to interrupt those behaviors? And should students be disciplined if they create enough disturbance to shut down an invited speaker? Is there a line that universities should draw here as well? Yeah, that's a hard. So, I mean, so for example, once again, David Duke, he gets more mentions from me than anybody. So um, <laughs> he, his goal was to get 15 minutes more of fame, and he was uh, good at that. So at the end of that event, we had six students who were arrested because they were blocking traffic. Um, five of the six weren't, weren't Dillard students. So that was part of the, the issue that I made mm -hmm. because we work with our SGA, and they held a, an, you know, an, a separate event to tell students, don't even go to that, don't even worry about that. Um, but those are the kinds of conversations because even the one student who was arrested, we did town halls the very next day and there were some faculty members that said, you know, well, we don't want anything to happen to those students. It's like, it's like yeah, I mean, it's not a big deal, we're okay, but that's not real life. So sometimes if people, you know, make those kind of protests and they get arrested, there will be consequences. I mean, that's that's the history of the civil rights movement. I mean, so I just felt like people now want people to be able to act out and not have consequences. So they need to have those conversations. And that's a part of what I tell students. People want to protest, but they don't study how King did it because they always study the issue 
had those conversations and they talked about what sacrifice might be need to make or what kind of sacrifice might you have to make, which means you might you know, have a water hose on you or the dogs at you or locked up in jail. They had those conversations. Now people want to protest and not have any consequences. Well, protest has never been like that. So I think we do people a disservice when mm -hmm. they don't understand that part of it. So I think we've got to do some education. Um, but it's, it's difficult because you don't, you know, it's not the goal to have people arrested. And particularly if it's your students and, you know, we, there was a brouhaha on our campus because some of the at the at the site of the debate, um, the crowd tried to push their way in and the organizers didn't want to have any audience. So it was like, why are y'all even worried about this guy? Nobody's even in the audience. It's just it's a made for TV event. But they were trying to push in and some people in the crowd were using pepper spray at our police. So then they responded to use some. And, but the only narrative is Dillard police pepper sprayed the students and then right. they forgot their pictures of them of police in the bathroom washing out their eyes because they were attacked first. Mm -hmm. So those are, it's just, it's just hard to manage that. So I don't know if there's a good answer. Um, you know, the only thing we said that we would do differently from that is that we probably would have created a perimeter uh, for that building, get some temporary fencing in so people could protest, but not give them as close access to the building. And that probably would have helped us out a lot so that was you know hindsight is 2020 that's the the learn you know the the takeaway we had from our event because that was the thing that we probably should have done differently mm -hmm. um but i don't i don't have a good answer for that so i'm ron probably does so i'm gonna listen to his answer and take notes <laughs> not really i mean what what i would say is that what we in, in our free expression statement it basically outlines you know kind of what actions what what, what you know what counter protests is acceptable and what what is not and even on our sharp viewpoint series we you know we we, we invite if, if people wanted to to stand up with a sign it, they were free to do so as long as they were not blocking someone but we made it clear if you're blocking someone you will be removed from the from the the auditorium um and then and when we had the ryan anderson incident you know that students i mean maybe, maybe university of richmond people students are very very uh just too nice, but I mean, they, they all, you know, they, they, they all acted within the confines of the agreed upon, um, um, you know, actions that they could take. They, they were white. They had signs, but they didn't disrupt the speaker, et, et cetera. But I, but, but let me also say that I agree with Walter. I mean, you know, um, uh, students need to understand when they are breaking the law that they can get in trouble. No, I don't. I don't. I don't care if it's on the campus. Uh, and so, you know, you 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 you're going to. You, 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 I, I'm I'm willing to be understanding and to go so far. But if if you know if if they're breaking the law, then I'm going to have to. We're going to have to take some action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I uh, I also think that something I'm hearing you both speak to here is that every incident's going to be different. It might. <laughs> You think, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, and 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 two that I mean that's that's different incidents on the same campus. Never mind that every campus is different how it's set up and public versus private and and uh, the tone of the student body. So yeah, I, I I appreciate you 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 working to get some answers here, recognizing that it's going to be it's going to be case by case. Um, sticking on this topic for another moment here, another person asked. Uh, one of the issues that has struck me as a liberal arts dean is how to account for their credentials of representatives of different viewpoints. And how those perspectives relate to the core educational mission of a college or university. In other words, how do you educate students about the credibility of speakers without patronizing students? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I think that um, in, there has been an effective movement to um, elevate people regardless of credentials. Uh, hmm. There's a, a, a book by, oh man, I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, that just talked about the end of expertise is the book. Um, Tom, I can't think of his last name right now, but it's, we, he really breaks, he takes an entire book to say, this is what's happened in our country, that people don't value experts. Everybody's an expert. Everybody's gone to the University of Google. 
They, you know, they're PhD from all those kinds of things. So they feel like they know as much as you. So like I said, I see that a lot, particularly on social media, when I've had people to say, look, this is what's happening with HBCUs. I'm like, I'm a president. I've been one for 18 years. You're telling me something that's not true. And they don't believe me. Well, I look this up. It's like, no, that's not that's not what that means. So they, they find certain things and they misinterpret it. So the challenge is everybody thinks they're an expert because they have access to Google and they don't even know how to Google properly. And so that's the, the challenge that I, I, I think that we're facing. I don't know how you address that. I don't I, I don't think we are in a position anymore to say here's a credible source. And here is it for like I, I said, I, we had Candace Owens and people, you know, she goes off on a rant about different things like, oh, now she's a medical doctor. It's like you might not like her, but there are millions of people who are listening to her and she has a voice that people are paying attention to. And she might not know a thing that she's talking about, but she has influence and people with influence can cause certain things to happen, good or bad. So, you know, I don't know if we're in a position, I, we, we've got to get people to think critically, but there is a mass movement of people that are sort of leaning into, you know, anti expertise. And that's what they they want to believe that and they lean into it. Um, yeah, that's it, it frustrates me because, like I said, I see that a lot, particularly on social media about something that I do every day and I have people act like they know more about it than I do. And I'm just like, there's just no way in the world. So it doesn't matter that I've been a president for 18 years and have a PhD in higher education. There are people who feel like they know more about HBCUs than I do. And there are people out there who will co-sign and says, yes, they're right. And you don't know what you're talking about. And I'm the one with the credentials. <laughs> so I don't know. It's a good, it's a great question, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know how we turn that tide because it has gone downhill very quickly. And we're, I think we're in a bad place in terms of expertise but that's right now expertise is dead in many regards yeah i mean ron i want to give you a chance to respond i mean i mean so so i mean i teach my, my background is teaching uh literature but but also writing classes and uh, basic you know 101 writing classes so there's a lot of basic and basic but but sort of fundamental information transferred there about critical inquiry research literacy information literacy that kind of thing how naive is it to believe that a campus that really prioritizes critical inquiry, information literacy, academic literacy, that that can spill over? Assuming that, assuming that you're not having external disruptors coming in, right? That that can spill outside of the classroom into the campus culture, and that you can engage a student body that whose faculty have been working with them on what literacy and expertise looks like, uh, versus just, I mean, we're, we're founded by John Height. Whose, whose core thesis is that at the end of the day, the elephant is, is you know, will be in charge if you don't control it, right? The, the emotional elephant, the heart leads. How naive is it to believe that that, that, can, that can impact a culture, a campus culture? Well, you, you know, let me, let me say what, in, in terms of that question, what we've always tried to do, so the Sharp Viewpoint series was the only speaker series that where, uh, there, where I, the president, invited speakers. Otherwise, they were faculty members inviting them. But we always um, connected our speakers to a group of faculty. And I had, you know, wanted somebody in my office, we would share the group, we would share who, who was coming. And then there would be faculty who would be engaged with their students. I mean, Carl Rove had an a, a terrific conversation with one of our leadership classes when he was, uh, when he was here. And, and that has really I mean, I mean, it, 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 there are a number of, of, of benefits of that, obviously, because you get you can get faculty then who require their students to come, which sure that's another issue. But yeah, but it, right. They, they show <laughs> at least they um, they show up. But I would also say, in terms of the students' thinking, you just mentioned uh, John uh, uh, John's elephant. Um, one of the things that my wife and I have felt have found to be really, really helpful with our mentoring groups and that I'm going to require when I teach my first year seminar is the open mind platform. Mm. Uh, having the students work through that and it, it gives them a, I mean, a, a deeper sense of why it's important to, enter, to, to talk to and interact with people who have differing views from yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So recognizing that there's there's learning in the classroom and there's learning 
beyond the classroom in, in all sorts of campus programming that we can be engaging students in. Because I remember being a student and sometimes the learning in the classroom would, would spill out and on, onto campus. I'd be, you know, learning about Shakespeare in the classroom and then, and then seeing the things he's talking about among my friends or, uh, you know, nothing deadly, but, uh, you know, or, or, or how he's describing nature. And there are other days where, where there's stuff I do in class and then there's stuff I do when I leave class and never shall the twain meet. Uh, and it was often that 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 programming, those events and talks and things that like you're describing, Ron, that were helpful for me, reminding me that, uh, you know, the whole campus is a learning environment and uh, the, the, the tools and the, the strategies I'm learning here, they can apply over here. The transfer matters. Um, I we only have 10 minutes here, but I really like to shift gears towards faculty. We've talked about students a lot, a lot tonight. Uh, there's a great question here for faculty that takes us back to social media for a moment. In your experience, how has social media changed with regard to how faculty share their views? How does response to those views manifest on campus? And how do you respond as president? I haven't had any issues. I mean, I follow some nationally of things that faculty members have posted and it created a stir and, you know, calls for that person to be fired. I haven't had anything like that. Because um, I think a lot of the faculty here who are active on social media really focus on their areas. Um, some might, I mean, some that deal with the politics, I mean, that could be a little dicey because they might have to go on camera and offer critiques of elected officials. But I mean, that's still within their purview. That hadn't been an issue. Um, but it, so I guess fortunately, I haven't had to deal with anything like that as of yet. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think that there has been some opportunities for administrators to really or even board members to stand up to support those faculty members. There's, I'm thinking about a faculty member at LSU who was very critical of elected officials and there are people who said he should be fired and the president said no free speech and really supporting academic freedom. But I, once again, I think with some of the legislation that's trying to be passed, there will be some additional challenges for faculty um, mm -hmm. who present viewpoints that people disagree with. So I think that we're just starting to see some of the benefits and I hope that campuses will support the right of those faculty members um, to be able to share their opinions as a citizen in a democratic process. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and in fact, I, you know, that's one of the four challenges outlined in the publication I talked about earlier, the, the mm -hmm. campus, uh, the campus free expression. You know, how do we ensure that we, um, that we, we protect our faculty or come to their defense when they, you know, tweet something that's very, very controversial. I mean, you know, within certain limits. I mean, as long as it's not, you know, lascivious or, what, or whatever. Um, um, and I mean, I, 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 I have had that experience only once on our campus, and it was really, um, some, you know, more uh, articles that were were um, critical of me, and you know, lots of people came to my rescue and. and and you know the and, and 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 like I said earlier, you know you have to be. I mean, that's the territory when you're president. Not everybody's going to love you, and if you know, and if if you want to be loved as a university president, then uh, my friend, my mentor Larry Backel said would say, buy a dog, you know, because everybody's not going going to love you. Sure. So um, you have to be you you have to be willing to. Um, uh, uh, to protect those faculty members, even when you may disagree with them, but it, 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 I think that's going to be, and I and I agree with Walter. You're going, it's going to, it's, it's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sort of related to that, there's sort of one. Well, there's one final question here. Um, what, what's the what is the balance between what you have described this evening as managing a campus that's centered in free expression and inquiry and uh, you know, reminding folks that stick around long enough, there'll be someone that 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 you want to hear, but also acknowledging that that there there is uh, pain, or I'm going to use the word trauma, which I know there's debate about about how appropriate that word is to use, but but discomfort, pain, trauma uh, that accompanies some stories that might be shared by speakers, or that that those speakers represent. Um, even more specifically than that, when potentially impacted students or faculty or staff are already disproportionately represented or supported on, on campus. What's, what's the arithmetic in your minds about how to manage the likelihood that, that yeah, there's, there's gonna be pain here. It might still be worth pushing through, but 
What's that balance as a leader? Well, you know, I, I think, I mean, it, it, again, going back to our free expression discussions, I think you have to be upfront and just say, you know, uh, it, that the microphone is not always open to everyone. There are some people who have more, more access to the microphone uh, than others. And you need to acknowledge that and, and ensure that your campus culture is such that everyone feels as though they belong and then help them, you know, help, help the students in particular work through that. I, I mean, that's the same, the same perspective I took with re removing the name from a building. You know, my, my question was, you remove the name and then what? How does removing the name materially improve the quality of the lived experience of black students or any students for that matter, right? Um, and so I, I think you have to acknowledge it. You have to, and you, you have to acknowledge that for some people it's, it's more painful than others. Um, um, but but when I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say something else here that, that may be unfair, but I, I know in my experience with black students on our campus, what I find to be really, really deleterious are those, and excuse me for saying it this way, liberal white faculty who kind of wrap their arms around the black students and say, oh, we're so sorry, you, you, you don't, you can't, you're, you're pained by having to study in that building with that evil man's name on it. How is that helping the students when they, when they go out into the real world? That's what I don't quite get, right? And, and again, you know, People are not going to agree with me when they, and I don't really care. But the thing is, we're we are educating students for a to go out into a world that's different from the university, and they need to to be resilient and robust. And again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying kind of you grin and bear it. No, I'm saying sure. you acknowledge it can be painful. It can be uncomfortable. But okay, and start from there, and then let's work on it and move forward. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I agree. It's, you know, I, I always say that if there's a speaker on a campus that students don't like or have issues with, just don't go. It's not like it's going to be forced that you have to listen to this person because there are plenty of people who speak on campuses that people don't know anything about. And the only ones we hear about are those that bring some type of celebrity because they're controversial. There have been plenty of controversial lectures given on college campuses that nobody heard anything about. <laughs> because it was held by some department and it was some obscure faculty member somewhere that no, it didn't get any press, nobody knew. And that person, whatever they said, would be just as painful as these other people. So, I, you know, I just, I think we have to tell people, you don't have to go. It's not going to be forced you to listen to this person, those kinds of things. Uh, and the same thing with the, the names. I know when Ron was dealing with that, I was like, man, I went to the University of Georgia and I know I went in all kinds of villains name for people who did not want black people there. And I mean, it's, I just, you know, I, I I don't know. I When people get wrapped up in that, it's like, man, it, if you took stock at all the places that you travel and go to and you really studied the names, you're gonna limit your whole worldview. So, I mean, if, I mean, just don't stop right there. If you really, you're gonna, if you're gonna live that life, then you start looking at all these places that you patronize and there are gonna be a lot of places that you won't go because the person who started it explicitly didn't expect for you to be there so yeah. i just I, I think sometimes we i think we do harm resilience when we make everything just you know very painful situation i think there are situations that can be but you know i don't know it's and you know, i'm my mother's kid in this regard you know when i was in elementary school and was in the woods in the backyard and got poison ivy and it was all in my face and my eyes were closed and my mom was like all right let's go to school i'm like Mom, I can't go to school like this. So my my uh you know my sensitivity might be a little bit less because she was like, you're gonna push through. But I mean, like I said, this is a woman who, you know, grew up in California. She went to Berkeley at a time when, you know, there aren't black people at Berkeley at all. So um she was just like, nope, you gotta push through. We don't make excuses. So mm -hmm. that, that 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 sort of colors how I think about some of these things, but um Yes, we just, you know, find the things that you like. If you know this is problematic, you just stay away from that. But there are problematic things that are happening in your community. It might not be on your campus, you know, and it might be somebody off campus that just didn't want that person. It's like, you don't even live on campus. How is this impacting you? You don't even have to see the person. Uh, so I think we've got to push back on some of that. I do. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Gentlemen, we are sadly out of time. I, I just want to say I'm I'm over the moon at 
how well you both expressed grace and empathy for the people on your campus and at the same time practicality and incisiveness uh, as leaders. I just you, you both were wonderful models tonight for for our our listeners. Thank you both for 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 doing that and for providing so many uh, high level things to think about and 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 stuff people could start adopting and thinking about tomorrow. Uh, it's really, really special. So thank you for that. Uh, to our to our listeners. Thank you so much for joining in. We really appreciate you being here. Just a reminder that, that HXA has a, a huge variety of resources and tools uh, in our, our resources library on our website that are pretty dedicated to this topic, especially how, how to engage and, and continue to promote a good, a good culture for campus expression. Uh, thank you all and uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings and see you all again soon. 